We tuned in. We were we went through um, uh, the first part of the uh, chapter fourteen. And a quick recap because um, uh, we were shamelessly stepped on by uh, Passover, which happens to be right where we're at. at Passover <laughs> in scripture. And I'm, I'll tell you guys, I did not do that on purpose, but it happened. We were just right there. And you know how we operate. We just go as long as we can and and, and we stop. But uh, yep. that was kind of neat. I thought that was pretty cool. So uh, last two weeks ago, we saw uh, the plot to kill Jesus. Uh, we saw the anointing in Bethany. Uh, by the lady with, uh, we I think we learned that that was Mary Magdalene, uh, lady with the flask who broke uh, the very expensive uh, ointment over Jesus. Somebody um, complained about it, and we learn in another gospel that it was actually Judas that was ahead of. He was the guy that most mostly complained about it and um uh, and but jesus supported her and he said that she is actually preparing me for burial and so uh, that seemed to, to pacify everybody but judas and so immediately judas this may be the tipping point he was going to do it anyway but this might have been the tipping point where judas went out and made the deal with the chief priest and uh so then uh, he had Passover with the disciples, and uh, we're going to see here in just a little bit that he likely, it was a secret location, but it was likely at the, um, at least the mother's house of John Mark, the writer of this gospel. It's very likely, according to the commentary, that they had the Last Supper in the upper room of John Mark's family house. So, and we'll see why in just a few minutes. It was, and this is interesting, they're having the Passover, and I learned this this week, and that's why we're kind of going back over this a little bit. And this is the first gold nugget of the night, by the way. It's on the 14th of Nisan in year 30 AD. Now, for Galilean Jews, the Passover was celebrated on Thursday evening, because they counted their Passover day from sunrise to sunrise. But the Judean Jews who were in Jerusalem counted their Passover day from sunset to sunset. So they celebrated Passover on Friday. So this difference in the Galilean and the Judean timekeeping allowed Jesus to celebrate Passover with his disciples on Thursday evening and to be the Passover lamb on Friday. I just thought that was the coolest thing. I had never heard that before. That is amazing. Um, John MacArthur taught that, and I think it was really neat. Another source was the Mishnah. And then, again, uh, the commentator, the uh, Roman commentator, Josephus, also mentioned that. Isn't that neat? So Jesus did Passover twice, but he was the Passover on the second time. So amazing. That was, that was one to write down there. Psalm 41.9. Yeah. Psalm 41.9. Yeah. Hmm. All right. Um, Funny how that works, isn't it? Huh? Funny how that works, isn't it? Oh, it's so cool. I, I love the second level of understanding. That is so neat. And there are many deeper levels. All this stuff I was listening to and reading this week, there's way more in it. I've got um, 10 pages here, but we're not going to go all over that. But there's way deeper. You know, there's just such good stuff. This is not Sunday morning stuff, you know? 
This is so good. This is so good. Uh, then Jesus goes on to foretell uh, uh, Jesus' denial, and that's pretty much where we cut it off. And uh, he's going to um, deny Jesus three times before the hot crow or the rooster crow twice. Now, Doug, would you like to share anything on that? Um, we went through this one time before, a long time ago. And um, I went back and I read into it because it seemed to me at one point I remembered somebody saying something about roosters and chickens not being allowed in Jerusalem. So when I went back and I I looked more into the translation of it, okay, the um, I'm trying to pull it up here. Uh, I found this one article where it explains it. It says sometimes a rooster is not a rooster at all. Okay, so when you read different articles, they talk about roosters and chickens in Jerusalem. And some people will say, well, they were allowed in Jerusalem. They raised them in Jerusalem. And that's why when Jesus would go to the courtyard, he was purging the courtyard of chickens and roosters. Well, he was purging them because they weren't allowed. Okay, and when I went through this article, okay, they were talking about a cockerel, okay, which... Uh, I'm trying to find the, they got a big article on it. They talked about um, the translation was um, Alec Taurus, I think it was, which converts to man or husband. Okay. So what they would do is every, every morning when it was time to prepare the temple, there was a, what they call the cockerel. Okay that would blow a trumpet or a ram's horn, okay? And he would blow it twice. He would blow it once to wake up and two to begin the preparations. Two, you know, the second time to begin the preparations. So when they were actually saying this, because chickens and roosters not being allowed in Jerusalem, okay, was lost in the translation that it was actually a man that was blowing the horn for the, the priests to prepare the temple. This happened on a daily basis. Um, some people argue that you were allowed to have chickens and everything else. So I even went into, in this article that I had where, uh, it breaks it down going into the Mishnah, which we, we remember what the Mishnah was, right? Mm -hmm. That was, uh, the laws that were the rabbinic laws that were written down from the old Testament so that they didn't have to constantly refer to and read through the whole Old Testament in order to find the laws. They had this book of laws that was written. It was six books and it was 63 tractates. But they even have references in there where you go to the Mishnah and it talks about the animals that are clean and the animals that are dirty. And if you ever have a chance, I highly recommend you go in and try and look at that because they divide it by birds with two toes, birds with three toes, um, birds of prey, birds that are on the ground, um, um, like your horses and your cows, okay? They're decided between clean and dirty by who has a split hoof and who has a solid hoof. I mean, the, the laws are so intricate that it was, it was unbelievable. And it just seems like it goes on and on and on forever. Yeah. So anyway, when they talk about the rooster crowing, it wasn't actually a rooster that would crow. It was a man would blow a horn twice. So. I think that's, that's, that's pretty good information. And um, I just sent you what Doug sent me, what he found and what he sent me. I sent you uh, a link in uh, GroupMe and uh, certainly worth, worth going over. I don't know that... Uh, Theologically, if it changes anything, but if anybody has an argument, well, that couldn't have happened because their roosters and chickens weren't allowed in Jerusalem. Well, we can go back to this and say, well, if that's the case, then here's the issue, you know. So good, right. good apologetic. Yeah. yeah. See, my, my whole thing was I was trying to find because you'll find so many articles that'll say chickens and roosters were allowed, and you were allowed, you found so many articles that say they weren't allowed because they were considered mm. unclean. Mm. So I, that's why I dug into it more until I was able to find something that had a, 
a, a, a Mishnah reference, yeah. which comes from the days of the Old Testament. And it yeah. was the laws written, the laws that governed the, uh, the city of Jerusalem and the, the Israelites and their, their laws that they live by. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Good find, Doug. Good find. Is that uh, that's that's pretty rare, and so that's that's a that was a good find. Good information. All right, we're gonna start reading here. And uh, Dad, you are up. Um, just verse thirty-two, though. It's a short one. Verse what? 32, 32. Verse 32. Yes, sir. Oh, well. Let me, let me scroll you up here to 32. There we go. Just the one verse. Yes, sir. Okay. <clears throat> and they went to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, sit here while I pray. Right. Gethsemane is a crude combination of two Hebrew words, Gat and Shamanim, uh, which is taken to mean the place where olive oil is pressed. And yeah, I bet you can see where I'm going already. Um, at an olive press, olives were gathered into rough sacks, and there was two methods, gathered into rough sacks and stacked one on top of the other. And then a beam was lowered onto the stack and increased weight was added to, in, uh, to the end of the beam, or, the, uh, or, and of course they'd be crushed, or the olives are placed between two rocks. So either way, the olive pit is crushed to produce the oil. More pressure equates to more oil. Oil is, of course, emblematic of Holy Spirit. Ergo, Jesus was to be crushed to bring forth Holy Spirit. Think about that. I had never put that together, together before. Wow. Yeah. We have, we've been to Gethsemane, and uh, it's a pretty place. It's got... Uh, the big old trees. Now we were told that one of the trees is thought to be old enough to be um, uh, be there when Jesus was there. Eh, might have been a ploy, maybe not. Who knows? Now it was a big, gnarly, old, ugly-looking tree, but it, I don't know if it was over two thousand or not. But anyway, that's what we were told. And then I've heard other people say that no, there's. There's no none of the trees left from that time frame. Hard to say. Again, doesn't really matter. Oh, uh, thirty-two. Also, um, while we're in the garden, let's let's look at uh, comparisons between Adam and Jesus. Adam hid from God in a garden, where Jesus presented himself in submission to the Father in the Garden of Gethsemane. Adam was in a perfect garden, where Jesus was in a garden of crushing. Adam was in a place of eternal life, but brought on death. Jesus is life, but chose to take on death to undo what Adam did. Eve and Adam failed. Um, oops, sorry. Eve failed and Adam joined her. Everyone around Jesus failed, but Jesus stood firm. This is my favorite. When Adam's side was opened, he gained a bride, which was Eve. When Jesus' side was opened, on the cross, the church's the church or his bride was formed. That was pretty deep. You got to think about that one. Uh, God told Adam he was he would be punished in three ways: sweat of your brow, thorns and thistles, and then finally death. 
Jesus experienced these three curses. Jesus sweat drops of blood in great turmoil. In fact, it was a condition called hematohydrosis. Hematohydrosis, where you sweat blood out of extraordinary strain. Uh, secondly, Jesus was given a crown of thorns, representing the curse given to Adam. And third, Adam was cursed because of a tree, but Jesus was crucified on a tree. So those are just some things that uh, you can kind of compare Adam and Jesus with and showing uh, the supremacy of Jesus, the undoing of what Adam uh, allowed to be done. All right, uh, 33 and 34, Doug. And he took with him Peter and James and John and began to greatly and, be, and began to be greatly distressed and troubled. And he said to them, My soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here and watch. All right. Well, look at the inner circle again. Peter, James, and John. Uh, these guys were exposed. When when else have we seen just Peter, Peter James, and John? Um, separated like this three chapters ago, something like that. Now, the transfiguration, it was these same fellows, Peter, James, and John. Um, so it, it's interesting, huh? When he went to the top of the mountain, top of the mountain, and um, they witnessed, um. Uh, Jesus, Moses, and Elijah, Elijah talking together. They wanted to know if they should build tents. Right, right. <laughs> he had to say something, right? The Peter. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, yeah, I thought that was pretty interesting. And then 34, um, you know, Jesus says that uh, he's so sorrowful that uh, he could, it, it, it could be even to death. And um, you ever extreme, experienced extreme sorrow when you feel like you could just die? Yep. 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 For sure. So, and, you know, our, our, our sorrow was extreme. And can you imagine the extreme of what he was feeling? Oof. Yeah, I think I'm okay now. All right, well, we'll let you do 35 and 36. All right. And going on a little farther, he threw himself on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might. He said, Abba, Father, for you, all things are possible. Remove this cup from me, yet not what I want, but what you want. Okay. I don't know you know, you Abba is, is a very personal, like, daddy type term. And so that's what Jesus is using. Daddy, please make this go away. And um, all things are possible with God. And so Jesus gives this statement many times throughout Scripture. I won't say many, but a lot of times he's, he's using it. We saw it just recently. All things are possible with God. Uh, and yet, he knowingly and he willingly complies with the plan of redemption despite its enormous cost and what it was what was about to happen so that was uh, you know we can we probably need to duplicate uh, and pray that more often than we don't than, than not um, uh, you know, saying saying here's what I desire. But if the answer is no, then I faithfully yield to your will. And uh, it takes a pretty mature Christian to be able to say that. Um, Skip Heitzig uh, shared uh, a little quip saying that you can kind of help remember uh, in this, uh, help remember uh, how to handle it is request and rest instead of name it and claim it. <laughs> So I think that's that's pretty wise. Request and rest instead of name it and claim it. So. 
There is a um, very good song if you get a chance to uh, to hear it. It's uh, by Jenny Owens. It's called If You Want Me To. So the, the premise is, I'll go through the fire if you want me to. And it's a prayer to the Lord uh, that tough things are happening, but um, uh, you, you're very willing to go through it if you want. Uh, I'm willing to go through it if you want me to. Uh, so it's, it's a good uh, song of surrender, so to speak. Uh, in fact, I can share that in group me as well. Why not? <clears throat> Later, I guess I'll show you that. All right, 37 and 38. How are how we doing there, uh, Andrew? Oh, he's at the wrong guy. Poor guy. He just keep pointing and shaking his head. Don't <laughs> go wrong. All right, 37. Back to Dad. Dad, uh, yeah. And he There's... came and found them sleeping, and he said to Peter, Simon, are you asleep? Could you not watch one hour? Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Okay. 37, you know, this may or may not have significance, but um, Peter's given name was Simon before Jesus gave him the name of Rock or Peter. And so it's similar to how God changed Jacob's name to Israel uh, when he was, uh, you know, uh, working in the will of God. He was referred to as Israel. But when he was working in the flesh, uh, Scripture says that people would refer to him, Scripture would refer to him as Jacob. So here in verse 37, we kind of see the same thing. You know, Jesus is, I mean, uh, Peter is falling asleep. And what does Jesus call him? He calls him Simon, his old name, his old nature, you know. Uh, may or may not be significant, but it seems to kind of fit in this, in this area. Seems to be kind of disappointing to, to Jesus. So in 38, um, uh, watch and pray, and uh, the flesh being weak. So this pretty much sums up man as, as a whole. Uh, we want to follow Christ in our spirit, but the flesh is weak, and so therefore, therefore, we need a Savior. And uh, so, thank you. Yeah, go my, ahead. my commentary mm -hmm. it has one little piece that says Jesus is totally forsaken, his disciples are sleeping. Contrast with Peter's statement in verse 29. Verse 29 okay. said. Peter said to him, even though they all fall away, I will not. Right. <laughs> right. But Peter was a fighter, but when it came to sleep, sleep is a tough. A tough hey, well, you're tired. You're tired. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh. All right. Uh, Doug, would you read 39 through 42? 39 to 42. I'll finish it up. And again, he went away and prayed, saying the same words. And again, he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were very heavy, and they did not know what to answer him. And he came the third time and said to them, Are you still sleeping and taking your rest? Is it enough? The hour has come. The Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. Mm. You know, all that bad stuff that he's been telling them is coming, it's there. And so that accelerando that we've talked about before, the drum beat getting faster and faster, it's at the point now where you can't tell where one drum beat begins and another one ends. So it's, it's a constant. It's as fast as it can go right now, all the way through the crucifixion. So it's on. The time is on. Uh 43, and uh, just to break it up, uh, I'll read 43 to 45, and immediately, there's a, there's a John Mark uh, statement, and immediately while he was still speaking, Judas came, one of the twelve, and with him a crowd with swords and clubs and the chief priest, uh, uh, from the chief priest and the scribes and the elders. Now the betrayer 
had given them a sign saying, the one I will kiss is the man, uh, seize him and lead him away under guard. And when he came, he went up to him at once and said, Rabbi, and he kissed him. All right, 43, we see these fellows are weaponized, even though there was no reason to have weapons. Uh, and John, the, the Gospel of John, it mentions that there was a cohort or a detachment, which is between 200 and 600 Roman soldiers. They were serious about gaining control over this Jesus guy. They were extremely serious. In uh, Matthew, let's see, Matthew, Mark, and Luke talk about the kiss to betray Jesus. But John uh, uh, didn't, didn't keep that in mind for some reason uh, and, and didn't mention a kiss. He, they mentioned, he mentioned uh, Judas was with him, but nothing about the kiss. But we do have to remember, I mean, different Gospels are from different people. And they're from different time frames. So uh, I actually went back and looked at the, looked this up. Luke was written 30 years after. No, let's see here. Let's start from the beginning. Mark was written 20 years after the event. Luke was written 30 years after. And John was written 50 years afterwards. So the memory on these things could be slightly different, but all the same, same event. And, uh, and plus two, when, uh, when you have multiple witnesses, it's really good that their statements are not exactly the same, but pretty much alike. So that's a pretty good indication that it actually happened. Uh, let's see, 46. Six and 47, we are back to dead. And they laid hands on him and seized him. But one of those who stood by drew a sword and struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his ear. Hmm. Um. In John 18.10, uh, it tells us that the, the one who cut off the ear was Peter, of course. And, uh, but here in Mark, the sword bearer is, uh, isn't identified. And, uh, but we got to remember that Peter was the primary source for John Mark's gospel account. So remember, John Mark wasn't there. He, well, he might not have been there. He wasn't there for that portion of the event. He wasn't certainly wasn't there as a disciple because he wasn't uh, a disciple of Jesus, one of the 12. Um, but he was the source for Mark's gospel. Peter was the source of, of uh, Mark's gospel. Uh, so therefore, he might not have mentioned, hey, that it was him <laughs> to mark that cut off the guy's ear, uh, struck out. Uh, 48 through 50, Doug. And Jesus said to them, have you come out as against a robber with swords and clubs to capture me? Day after day, I was in the temple with you teaching and you did not seize me. But let the scriptures be fulfilled. And they all left him and fled. Hmm. All right. So who was it that left him and fled? Um, wasn't, the so wasn't the soldiers, was it? No. Disciples. Disciples. They took off. Uh, but again, that was prophesied. I love the way that he told them. He says, you know. He says, you've had all the opportunity in the world to take me, and you never have. But now all of a sudden, you got to come out on this dark night, bearing right. swords with all these people. Yep. <laughs> what am yep. I going to do? <laughs> right, exactly. Exactly. All right, Doug, 51 and 52 may be the most uh, strange part of uh, this particular chapter. 
Okay. Um, and a young man followed him with nothing but a linen cloth about his body. And they seized him. But he left the linen cloth and ran away naked. Hmm. I have never seen that. <laughs> <laughs> not that I can recollect. And I would think I would. <laughs> what a strange deal. You're not, you're probably not going to hear a sermon on that one. You know? <laughs> probably not. But you know, uh, reading commentary and different commentaries kind of put together a little story here. And I mentioned earlier that it's very likely that, that uh, commentators say, scholars say, that John Mark lived in the household <clears throat> that they probably did the Passover meal in, most likely. So remember that, that, that concept. Um, first of all, the upper room where they had the Last Supper was likely John Mark's mother's house. Mark was probably about 18-ish, somewhere in there. Second, the Passover meal was one of a uh, one of leisure and could go late into the evening, late at night, midnight-ish. Number three, Jesus told Judas to go and do what he had to do. You know, sometime during the meal. Number four, Jesus and the disciples left a little later and went to the garden to pray, but Judas was unaware of the movement. All right, you follow the story so far? He sent Judas away. Judas doesn't know where they might have gone. At this point, it doesn't matter, but it will. Fifth point, Judas went to his contacts and gathered the soldiers. Number six, Judas and his posse of two to six hundred soldiers went to Mark's house. It doesn't say this in scripture, but it's in, you can kind of see this happening. Went to Mark's house to get Jesus because that's the last place that Judas saw Jesus and discovered they were gone. But Judas knew Jesus often prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane. Number seven, Mark was already in bed, and according to tradition, they would sleep in a linen cloth. The wealthier people would sleep in a linen cloth. Number eight, Mark didn't take the time to put on proper clothes and followed the crowd of soldiers to the Garden of Gethsemane, where he was discovered, chased, Somebody grabbed his linen cloth and he ran away naked. I think that's a pretty good assumption of what might have happened and why it's even mentioned in Mark. What do you think? Because it was Mark. Because it was Mark. Interesting, huh? So it, maybe he was too embarrassed to say that was me. Uh, of course, Mark never mentions himself in here, so maybe that's another good reason. It's just, here's what happened. There was a young man. Whether it be me or somebody else, here's the issue. So this actually happened. thought that was interesting. And, uh, that would be good reason not to say it. That would be a good reason not to say it, why you went squeaking in, garden, in the Garden of Gethsemane. Yeah. Naked. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, Jesus before the council. So um, let's see, 53 and 54. Is it Dad or Doug? Which one? Dad. Dad? 53 and 54. And they led Jesus to the high priest, and all of the chief priests and the elders and the scribes came together. And Peter had followed him at a distance, right into the courtyard of the high priest. And he was sitting with the guards and warming himself at the fire. All right. 
So all in all, we're about to see a series of, of uh, Jack Leg trials. Uh, the first three are in front of Jewish people. The last three are, are secular or civil. And so the first three, there's uh, before uh, Annas, the high priest, and then the second one is Caiaphas, his son-in-law. The third one is before the Sanhedrin, uh, when they decide that he's worthy of being put to death. Um, even though they don't have authority to put to death, but they send him on to somebody who can, which would be Pilate. That's the fourth one. And then they play some ping pong with Herod Antipas. He, sent, he sends him to Herod Antipas. And then we'll see him sent back to Pilate finally. So he had six trials in one night. And uh, it's kind of kind of big picture of what's going to happen. But, you know, in 54, we see Peter, and we know that he's going to de deny Christ um, later on. But we give the poor guy a hard time. But the fact of the matter is, the rest of the disciples um, were all heels and elbows. But Peter, at least, was on the scene. we got to give him credit for that. He's Yeah, he's going to fail, but you know what? He was trying and he was at least on the scene. So we, we don't want to give him too too hard of a time, you know. He was also the one that stepped out of the boat when Jesus said, come on, right? Out on the water. And uh, we give him a hard time for sinking. But you know what? He was the only one that tried, <laughs> you know. But uh, before we go on, I think we probably ought to land the plane.